Good morning. Uh, we're going to look this morning at Psalm 15. So I'm going to read the psalm, uh, say a few words about it, and then we'll pray together. So Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle, who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose way of life is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbour and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honours those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Now, in ancient Israel, the centre of the nation was the tabernacle. Well, first the tabernacle, then it was replaced by the temple that Solomon built. Uh, now, the tabernacle was a tent, and it was the place where God himself would dwell in the midst of the people. It was a remarkable thing. Uh, God at the very centre of the nation, at the centre of the life of his people. It was a big deal. Uh, so the people uh, carried that burden because God himself was at the centre. But it was also a tremendous privilege and joy. And uh, to have that temple, that tabernacle, to have God among them, uh, was just remarkable. Now there were different festivals through the year in ancient Israel and uh, three of them required a journey to the tabernacle or to the temple, uh, a pilgrimage. And uh, it seems that the story behind this psalm uh, that we're to imagine is, is of some pilgrim maybe approaching uh, the time of festival and approaching Jerusalem and Mount Zion uh, where the tabernacle and then the temple uh, was, uh, was built. And it's a big deal. Uh, it's costing you a lot of money uh, to get there. It's also a big occasion. Thousands of people gathering. And maybe you're travelling with family and community from your home up to the, uh, the festival. So that's the, the story, I think, behind Psalm 15, the thing that helps us to bring it to life. Now, the first thing we see is that as a person approaches God, uh, there's a question to ask. It's there in verse 1, Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle, who may live on your holy mountain? Now, I think that question's an interesting one. If that question has never occurred to you, really it's a question that's asking, who qualifies? Who is able to draw near to God? Who is good enough? Who meets the standard? And I think if that's never occurred to you, that question, then that's probably a sign that you've never really understood. You've never understood about God. It's very easy for us to domesticate God and tame him and cut him down to a slightly bigger version of ourselves and uh, manage him uh, with our behaviours or whatever it may be. And yet the God of the Bible, the God that speaks to us and emerges from these pages and indeed the God we see behind all of creation uh, is is holy 
and transcendent and glorious beyond imagination and holy angels that have no sin and who dwell in heaven itself, even they hide their faces before his glory and holiness and majesty. Uh, you know, Mount Sinai was a defining moment in God's revelation of himself to Israel and to the world. And it was an awesome experience. And when you were drawing near to God, uh, you had to bring a sacrifice. You didn't just come as you were. You brought an animal. You had to make an atonement. So this first question is a vital question. And it's a question we should be asking ourselves today. Well, who can come to God? Uh, who can dwell in his tabernacle? So there's a question to ask. Uh, it's important not to just presume. Uh, the second thing, though, and this is the bulk of the psalm, verses 2 to 5, uh, there's an answer to that question. And then what I want you to see here is what's important for us to get is that it's an impossible answer. I mean, look at it. Uh, who can come? Well, their walk has to be blameless. Their works have to be righteous. Their words have to be truth from the heart. That's verse 2. Their words have to be uh, measured and truthful. Uh, they must not wrong a neighbour. They must no, not slur another person. Uh, verse 4, uh, they must despise a vile person but honour those who fear the Lord. Uh, now, on a good day, maybe we feel we could approximate some of these, some of the time for some people, but these are big statements that are calling us to be blameless, to walk in righteousness, to speak in truth uh, and there's a tremendous standard here of integrity and holiness and well look at them uh, how's it going how are you doing well i think the answer is not so well certainly that's my answer uh, not so well and and maybe you're thinking hang on now um, a little bit of pushback comes to mind. I look at you find somebody to criticise because that's what we do when we're feeling a bit threatened. Um, so, so verse four. I don't like the sound of verse four. That doesn't sound like love your neighbour. It talks about despising a vile person. We're not supposed to despise anyone, are we? How is that right? And and honouring those who fear the Lord. Okay, but didn't Jesus? Wasn't he the friend of of sinners? Well. That question's occurred to you. Um, yes, Jesus certainly was and is the friend of sinners. And that statement in verse 4 about despising a vile person and honouring those who fear the Lord, uh, that's not a statement about hating people and uh, rejecting people. That's a statement about loyalty and uh, where your commitments lie. So that you recognise that in a fallen world there are things that are wrong and there are people that do wrong and there are people that are wrong. And though you would uh, share the gospel with them and help them in time of need, yet you wouldn't line up alongside them in the, the battles of life. I'd also say, notice how desirable this list is. At the very end of the psalm, whoever does these things will never be shaken. Well, that's a highly desirable thing. So, so here's the question in verse 1, and here's the answer. Uh, who can dwell in the tabernacle? Who can approach God? Well, it's someone who's blameless and righteous and loyal, who does what is good. And uh, not only is it not going so well, it's, uh, it's just impossible. So what are we supposed to do with this? Um, well, this is what we're supposed to do with it. We're to recognise that what's being raised here for us is the problem that the whole Old Testament raises. 
you know, in the Old Testament, you've got these amazing promises from God of salvation and life, blessing for the nations, uh, amazing promises put a thousand different ways, and yet you also have these conditions. So God is loving and gracious, but God is also holy and just. And sometimes we're thinking that he's making unconditional promises to save us. And then at other times, like this, it seems like he's putting up conditions in our way that we just cannot meet. And the whole Old Testament does that all the time. And it creates a, a sort of big tension. And we're left thinking, well, hang on, which is it? Um, is, is this unconditional love? Or are there conditions that have to be met? Well, that leads me to the third thing to say, the last thing to say. Uh, because when you come to the New Testament, there is a wonderful resolution to that tension. Because in the New Testament, God himself comes. That's who Jesus is. And uh, Jesus does something wonderful. He fulfills the conditions for us. So Jesus lives a righteous life. He's the only person who has ever lived a righteous life. Jesus lives a righteous life. And then having lived a sinless, righteous, holy life that could pass these things with flying colours, he then offers up himself as the ultimate sacrifice, paying for the fact that we have not done this and we have not lived like this. That's the resolution the New Testament brings. Are these promises from God, are they unconditional? Or are they conditional? Well, the answer is yes. They are both. But what's so wonderful is that God himself has met all the conditions. The love of God has satisfied the justice of God through the life and death and resurrection of the Son of God, so that people like you and me, who don't qualify, can become the people of God. That's why Christianity is so exclusive. It's only in Jesus that this can be found. You've got to be in him. But it's also why Christianity is so inclusive. Because... If it's not about me and my performance, and it's not about you and your performance, and it's not about them and their performance, then anyone can come. And anyone uh, can find Jesus to be their saviour. And so the answer of the New Testament is that in Christ we are credited with righteousness, and then ultimately on that last day we become holy and fully righteous. And so we are able to dwell forever in the house of the Lord. Let's pray together. Our sovereign Lord, uh, we are sorry uh, that we so quickly domesticate you and forget that our God is a consuming fire and that you dwell in that light which no man can approach, and that the seraphim uh, around your throne cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so we do pray that you'd help us to tremble a little more today, and to remember who you are, and to remember uh, that we are not what we need to be. But Lord, we thank you for the great trajectory of your word, which raises profound questions for us, unanswerable questions. Who can dwell in the tabernacle of the Lord? Uh, we don't meet the grade, Lord, but we thank you that as the, the scriptures raise these impossible questions, they also give us unimaginable answers, that the very God of holiness and glory should become flesh, and live for us that sinless, perfect, righteous life. And then having fulfilled all righteousness, to think that he would offer up himself as a sacrifice 
for our sins. Lord, we thank you that the door is wide open. It's only in Jesus. He himself is the new and living way. But it is a new and living way that is open to all who will come. And we pray that in these days, many would, uh, that you'd be working by your Spirit, striving in the hearts of many to open us up to uh, the realities beyond what we can see and taste and hear and touch. Lord, uh, we pray for a breaking in of eternal things into time, into our communities, into this community. Lord, will you come down again by your Spirit and awaken us to your glory and sovereignty and that we might tremble and then also, Lord, to your love and grace and wonderful salvation that we might believe and be justified by grace and be saved and be accepted and know that heaven is our home and that we shall dwell forever in the house of the Lord. And Lord, we pray for our current situation. We pray for those profoundly ill. Lord, would you restore them to health and strength. Bring them back, Lord, we pray. Protect those, and there'll be people known to us, Lord. We bring them to our minds now. We pray for those in the NHS and in other frontline services who are exposed uh, to infection in a way that the rest of us aren't, and who are working in a way the rest of us aren't. Lord, will you give them grace and strength, encourage them, help them. May they look to you as the helper of the weak, as the protector of the vulnerable, as the saviour of the lost, as the healer of the broken. Lord, please, may many people uh, be turning to you in these days. And we thank you for our community here in Grangetown and in other communities would be similar. Lord, we thank you for the way people rally and for the help that there is. Lord, uh, continue that, we pray. Uh, we ask too for our government and pray for continued recovery for the Prime Minister. And we pray for wise decisions. And when there are judgment calls, Lord, give good advice and help them to uh, choose the right course. Give creativity and give unity, give clarity, we pray as these vital decisions are made. So Lord, please hear us. We think too of those who are working on a vaccine and uh, Lord, we pray that there would be rapid progress made. And as we pray for this nation and this community, we pray across the world, Lord. We pray especially for countries that are very vulnerable without robust healthcare services or without strong community. Uh, Lord, please uh, help and save. So we look to you today. We ask your blessing, your encouragement. We ask you to keep us and help us. Uh, help us to rest in your love, in the deep, deep love of Jesus. And Lord, help us to walk with you. And help us, Lord, that as we know more of your Holy Spirit's work within us, that more and more our way would become blameless. And our words would become truthful and that we'd be remade in the image of your son. And thank you, Lord, that that is the end of the journey, that you are working so that your people would be conformed to the likeness of your son. And we thank you that there will come a day, that last day, when we stand before you, risen in the power of Jesus, uh, Lord, that this psalm will be true of us and true of us forever, that sin will be no more and that we will never be shaken. And Lord, we want that work to begin now and to move forward now. Help us to grow, help us to progress. And even in this time of adversity, especially, Lord, in a time of adversity, we pray that we would grow uh, deep in our knowledge of you. So be with us today, help us. Uh, we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, hope you have a good day and uh, see you tomorrow.